Hi there, I'm Richard Lewis from Cadred.org. We're going to do something a little bit different today, and that is we're going to take the time to talk about one of my personal heroes in gaming. Without them, I'm pretty sure we'd be about 10 years behind where we are now. They single-handedly changed the face of the gaming industry, invented sub-genres, um, pushed strategic gaming to a previously unseen level. And they weren't Japanese, they weren't American, they were British, and they did it all from their bedroom, uh, probably in a setting not dissimilar to this one. I want to talk to you today about the career of one Julian Gollop. For those of you who don't already know the name, Julian Gollop was one of those first generation of British coders that came out in the early 80s. He had a career that spanned over two decades, continues to work in the games industry today, and was also one of the founding members of one of the biggest PC franchises of the 90s. His first job in the coding industry came while he was still at school for a company called Redshift Limited, which was a friend software house which he worked at until 1984. Having been involved in the development of two games on the BBC Micro, Time Lords and Islandia, he then moved on to the Spectrum 48K where he made his debut with Battle Cars. Battle Cars took its inspiration from Mad Max, the idea of a post-apocalyptic world where warring gangs were fighting each other in makeshift battle buggies. In this game, players could just race against each other or go head to head in a battle using a variety of weapons attached to their cars, be it flamethrowers or mines that would drop out the back. A lot of people criticised the overly simplistic gameplay, but it was a pick up and play masterpiece for the time, 1984. Unfortunately, the game was consigned to obscurity purely and simply because there were other titles out there at the time, which include Car Wars, which was a game published by Steve Jackson of fighting fantasy fame. While not commercially successful though, it was a confident debut and his next game would be one that would really cement his reputation as an innovator within the industry. 1984's Nebula was an incredibly simple but incredibly addictive space conquest game that effectively created a whole subgenre in its own right. The premise of the game was quite simple. Up to five players, assuming the role of intergalactic leaders, would then try and conquer the known galaxy, which they would do by distributing resources in a way very similar to the Risk board game. There were random events such as civil unrest and plague, which would cause problems and fluctuations in how these resources would be distributed. So that's right, as early as 1984, Julian Gollop had effectively created the subgenre of games that would go on and become known as 4X, which is Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate. And if you've ever played a Master of Orion or Sins of a Solar Empire, you've got to say that Nebula is realistically the forefather of all of those games. Capping off a great year for Gollop was Rebel Star Raiders, the game that would eventually be the precursor of Laser Squad and in turn the XCOM series. An extremely simple game, it brought in concepts such as line of sight, uh, use of action points and other things that top down turn based strategy games would go on to take for granted as the genre evolved. The 1985 classic Chaos put Julian Gollop on the map and was released by Games Workshop it itself being inspired by an earlier game that they had made, a board game called Warlock. Now, it was quite simple. It was up to eight players, hot-seated, of course, uh, and you had wizards that were given random spells, and you had to cast these spells. Each spell had a varying percentage chance of success, and you had to attack each other uh, with these spells. The last man standing won. I could wax lyrical about how great a game Chaos actually is. Uh, it may have come out in 1985, I'm not ashamed to say I still play it now. It's the reason I've got a Spectrum emulator installed on my PC. And what it actually did so well, what it created that no game at that time really had was every time you played it, it was completely different. The random spells, the random ways the wizards would behave based on the spells that they would have. And not just that, it was incredible to think you could have eight people playing at once in this kind of arena. Uh, if you think about it logically, although there was no computer that could realistically run uh, real-time strategy games, and indeed real-time strategy, although there had been some kind of dabblings with it on uh, the likes of Spectrums and Commodores and Amstrads in the 8-bit era, 
there hadn't really been uh, one that had kind of succeeded. But you could argue that had you know real-time strategy been uh, a realistic capability at the time, this would have been the first MOBA title. This far <laughs> uh, predates the likes of Dota and and other games but ultimately it's the same at its core it's a bunch of wizards fighting each other to the death using various abilities and it's also got a great level of tactical detail the percentage chance of the spells fluctuates based on something called the winds of uh, magic which uh, it's a split between law and chaos each spell being aligned or neutral and therefore not influenced by these mathematical fluctuations so timing on your spells could be absolutely crucial to winning a game i literally cannot sing the praise of this game anywhere near enough to do it justice and if you played it the first time around if you're an old fart like me and you can actually uh, remember playing it you know exactly what i'm talking about if you haven't uh download it and just try it you will honestly be amazed uh, people are still trying to emulate it now and, and copy it but it will never be bettered um, so much so that my first article way way back when I started writing for Cadred, um, we are going back some way there, was a tribute to Chaos which uh, they published despite having no relevance to esports at all by 1986, Gollop was making something of a name for himself, and his latest project would be to revisit one of his earlier works, Rebel Star Raiders. What he produced was a graphical overhaul and improved version of the same scenarios in that game, simply called Rebel Star, which was put out on Telecomsoft's budget label, the legendary Firebird, which released so many classic titles at that time. There were huge gameplay improvements as well as graphical ones. It had this new thing in it called Opportunity Fire, which was if a unit that strafed into your view uh, from a previously unseen position, you could take a shot at it if you had enough action points left. It also had more statistics under the hood. It had things like morale and encumbrance and all these other factors to take into consideration for how your troops would perform. What he had created in 84 was then the benchmark of squad tactical games. With this, he totally raised that bar once again. Needless to say, the game was a critical success. All of the Spectrum magazines at the time gave it positive reviews. And the incredible thing to consider was that this game, as revolutionary as it was, as huge as it was, was released on a budget label for the price of just £1.99. One good turn deserves another, and in 1988, Gollop returned to the Rebel Star franchise with Rebel Star 2, a game that was ahead of its time, not just because of the actual game mechanics, which in truth were just an extension of what we'd already seen in previous Rebel Star games, but in the actual storyline behind the game, uh, it had subtle references to both Aliens and Predator. And in 1988, there wasn't really a big furor about the crossover between the two. For example, in the game, there's characters called Vasquez and Hudson, a direct reference to James Cameron's Aliens. The aliens that you fight aren't like anything encountered in previous Rebel Star games. In fact, they look like the aliens, the Xenomorph from Aliens, but behave very much like Predators. It was this kind of knowing wink to the uh, film industry that you could actually get away with back then uh, because, you know, copyright wasn't quite as so broadly defined. But also, it was what Julian loved to do. It was a loving tribute to something that was already there, that people uh, who were playing these games were already very much into. If Rebel Star 2 was something of a filler game, the title that would follow in the same year, Laser Squad, would be, at that point, Gollop's absolute masterpiece. It took the ideas that had been applied in the previous Rebel Star games and refined them, took them to new levels. Uh, it wasn't just about squad-based combat. Uh, it wasn't just about tactics and turn-based strategies. All of a sudden now, you had clear objectives to achieve in-game, and this ranged from shutting down power plants to assassinating wealthy businessmen. The game was a critical success, receiving rave reviews across the board. But as time has marched on, it seems to be that the game is best remembered for being the skeleton of what would become the XCOM franchise, but we'll come to that in a moment. For me, this game was an absolute revelation. I'd loved the Rebel Star series, I'd loved Chaos, and what this did was really bring in some new and interesting elements to the gameplay. For example, morale and the way that 
factored in. Uh, if uh, a unit witnessed the death of a, another unit, then they would panic. They would throw their gun on the floor and start running away shrieking. Of course, I'm imagining the shrieking part, but you get my meaning. And what it also did that was revolutionary at the time was it brought in expansion packs. So existing players could go out and uh, buy tapes cassettes if you remember those with new levels on that the laser squad could take part in while it might be something of a stretch to say that Gollop had invented DLC decades before that would become common usage uh, some of these missions were very interesting in what they brought to the table for example uh, the scenario laser platoon was a free-for-all deathmatch uh, where it was basically a symmetrical map where people had to kind of just attack, 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 attack until somebody achieved enough victory points. And we've seen this game mode applied to so many others, especially within the FPS genre. Laser Squad was Gollop and Mythos Games' most successful title to date, and that success allowed them to be able to branch out and obtain more opportunities as we moved away from the 8-bit era. Before we get to the moment, I'm sure you've all been waiting for the true watershed moment in Julian's career. I'll just give a brief mention to the sequel to 985's Chaos, Lords of Chaos. Um, why so brief? Well, it was a major disappointment for me being such a big fan of the original game. What it brought in was this ability to now kind of pre-create your wizards, which is very sophisticated. But the fact that you could choose the spells meant that it like that spontaneity and randomness games were always kind of the same you always knew what you were going to have at your disposal that combined with the huge maps and the fact that you were only up against a limited number of opponents including independent creatures it just didn't really have the same kind of spark for me and i i know it was well received and indeed critically acclaimed but it was a bit of a disappointment and one that i want to kind of muddle through That introduction might not look like much, but to anyone who played 1994's UFO Enemy Unknown, that introduction is all kinds of awesome. It was one of the best games of its time, and if you go back and play it now, even in 2012, the game still really, really stands out as just one of the greatest PC games of all time, and I'm going to tell you why. UFO was the culmination of everything good that Gollop had done so far and he brought them together in this one amazing package that totally blew away the gaming community in 1994. The reason it was so successful and critically acclaimed was that it combined two distinct genres in a way that had never been done before. On the one hand you had this awesome turn based tactical strategy combat game the likes of which we'd seen with Rebel Star and Laser Squad before it but almost similar to a civilization or a game of that nature it was as much about resource management and researching new technologies as part of the broader metagame. 
specifically players were in charge of the defense against UFO invaders on planet Earth and you went into the game really not knowing what you were going to get that introduction gave you an inkling that there was going to be some kind of combat and some you know manga looking villains but really what unfolded was this brilliant complex storyline and it came to you in stages every time you played the game initially you would sit around waiting for the first UFO to appear and then you'd have to go shoot it down and then deploy your squad to the crash site and what you would almost always certainly find will be a few survivors typically sectoids in your first mission and I'm not going to ruin too much by going into all the different types of aliens but literally the storyline that came with the game was incredible it really sucked you in and it was just something the like of which had not been seen before what was unique was that in order to be effective you had to research alien technologies that you discovered at the crash site and then develop them into something that could be used against the alien invaders not only that you would have to do autopsies on the body so you could find out what weapons would be the most effective and you even had to capture live aliens and interrogate them and this was an integral part of the game because without it you couldn't get to the alien base so it just brought these new elements, these new gameplay elements that had never been seen before together in such a spectacular fashion. The game was a huge turning point for the gaming industry, showing that you could think outside the box, combine genres that wouldn't necessarily go together on the surface of it, and create something special that would be revered by gamers for a long, long time. And if you're in any doubt about that, I would like you to just go onto Google and Google the upcoming remake and see the furor and frenzy surrounding it, the excitement. The game is still relevant to this day, and you can pick it up on Steam for about £5 as part of an XCOM bundle, which I seriously recommend you do. Another barometer of just how much UFO was actually loved can be seen in the reception that the sequel got which had nothing to do with Gollop and Mythos games it just used the same code that had been licensed by Microprose. Terror from the Deep was little more than a fiendishly hard graphically inferior version of UFO Enemy Unknown but fans yummed it up anyway. Despite the fact Gollop wasn't involved it still received fairly good reviews even though a lot of critics did just dub it UFO Enemy Unknown but with bubbles. The reason that Gollop had decided not to be involved with the project was that after the critical success of the first game he wanted to do a radical overhaul again and push the bar that little bit further whereas Micropose seemed intent on cashing in with a quick sequel. It would be three long years before Julian got to make his true sequel to UFO Enemy Unknown, but when it came in the form of XCOM Apocalypse, it was met with mixed reviews. People didn't quite know what to make of it. The first stumbling block for some people was the plot, which was set 50 years after events in the first game, but didn't coherently link. The new alien threat had no links to those encountered in the first game, and indeed, you only get the briefest glimpse of a sectoid in certain missions that occur which I won't spoil by revealing too much about now. The game also moved away from its totally turn based route and implemented a real time mode which again players weren't quite sure what to make of it especially from somebody that had such a name in the turn based strategy genre. Those who stuck with it though were rewarded with a rich gameplay experience and an incredible storyline. No longer was it just XCOM versus the aliens, there were so many different organizations that had to be pandered to and appeased, including a creepy cult which worshipped the aliens that would sabotage your bases in between missions. And while you're all thinking about a joke relating to Scientology, I'm going to tell you about how good the AI was and how the aliens would learn from your tactics. If you set up with close combat weapons, they would quickly realize that they could keep you at range and keep their distance. If you used to have a heavy bombardment, not recommended because every time you damaged scenery, you lost favor with the organization who owned the building and sometimes had to pay reparations, uh, they would simply get in close to prevent you from using those weapons. It was very, very smart and very, very very difficult. The game never received the same level of adoration that UFO Enemy Unknown did and that's a real shame because it fleshed out the universe in a way that the other games couldn't because of the way they were made. 
it brought to life new concepts and ideas like the ability of hiring androids they they didn't level up like other soldiers but they were not susceptible to psionic attacks or the idea of human sectoid hybrids who you could hire in a city that had latent psychic ability little details such as those really brought the game to life but what also has to be mentioned is just how open-ended XCOM Apocalypse actually was in UFO Enemy Unknown it was pretty linear you were on the rails you had to capture an officer interrogate them find out the base blah 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 it had to be done in a set order with Apocalypse how you proceeded was entirely up to you indeed you could be a corporate little bitch and answer all the distress calls that were thrown your way in a timely fashion to earn money and hope that a ceo wasn't infested with an alien maggot in his brain and shut you out entirely or you could operate outside of the law do whatever you want blow up buildings and become self-funded kidnap people kill them maim torture and probably just getting a little bit carried away but the point is that you could do whatever you wanted within that particular realm gollop himself was disappointed with the final product Blaming the fractured relationship between Micropose and Mythos Games. Micropose were in charge of the graphics, Mythos in charge of the code. Calling the relationship disastrous and saying that the end product could have been so much more. But I think that's a little bit harsh and I don't think you realise what he actually created and how well respected it is amongst fans of the series and indeed his work. While that wasn't the end of the XCOM franchise, that was the end of Gollop's involvement with it and he got back to the unfinished business of trying to create a definitive sequel to Chaos. Magic and Mayhem once again saw Julian dip his toe into the real-time strategy waters and with mixed results. The game had lots of nice touches from the mechanics of the unique spell casting system right the way through to the claymation cutscenes that conjured up memories of Ray Harryhausen. Still, the game bore little resemblance to any of the previous Chaos titles and didn't really feel as if it deserved to be compared to them. The linear storyline was always at odds at games that Julian had created in the past, but this wasn't a good enough reason for the game to have bombed commercially as it did. If looked at with fresh eyes, Magic and Mayhem can be interpreted as a precursor to many more successful titles, even if it is consigned to gaming obscurity as of the moment. It took some time before Gollop decided to try his hand again and real time strategy hadn't really been that kind to him so he went back to what he knew, turn base and he went back to another one of his previous franchises, Laser Squad. The resulting game Laser Squad Nemesis by 2002 however was somewhat anachronistic in both its gameplay mechanics and its goals. In a time when online gameplay was starting to flourish the idea of having a play by email game seemed really out of step with what was going on in the gaming world. It's a shame because the game actually got good reviews and featured a pretty solid single player campaign that showed he hadn't lost his touch for producing great turn based strategy titles. However an outdated mode of online play combined with a subscription fee that wasn't exactly cheap for what you were getting meant that the game was largely ignored and even though there's a hardcore community out there that still play the game they're small in their numbers a real shame too because there were some good ideas there and had they been better channeled this could have been something that fans wanted if that sounds like we're ending on a bum note it absolutely shouldn't because there are some systems that are better suited to the kind of games that Gollop likes to produce and does so very well for example the Game Boy Advance that has a slew of turn based titles on it once again revisiting a familiar franchise Rebel Star Tactical Command on the Game Boy Advance was well received and did quite well commercially even though a lot of the players who would have been playing this incarnation of the game probably never played the originals. The story doesn't even end there because in 2011, just last year, he oversaw the production of Ghost Recon Shadow Wars on the Nintendo DS, another turn-based tactical strategy game very similar to Rebel Star Tactical Command. A time when the games industry is in this awful stagnation, when everything is a copy, a clone of something that's gone before, it's good to think back to those who truly pioneered and brought us something new and special which Julian Gollop certainly did and I hope he continues to do so for many years to come. For some of you I'm sure this video has just been nostalgia a trip down memory lane but for those of you who've never come across any of Gollop's games before I would absolutely implore you to go find them, download them, do whatever you have to do to try them because he truly deserves your support and until you've experienced them firsthand you really don't know what you're missing. Anyway, that was the first in the series of Heroes of Gaming. We're going to be bringing you more of these videos, looking at people who've made a telling contribution. Until then, stay tuned to cadred.org. I'm Richard Lewis. Thanks a lot.